I'm going to be talking about strategies to avoid non-target herbicide impacts and specifically in a wildland weed management setting. Uh, as Shoba mentioned, I um, oversee our integrated pest management program um, within the lands program, the CDFW. So that's um, all of the IPM that occurs across the state on our ecological reserves and wildlife areas. Um, and given my background in toxicology, the one of the main focuses that I really kind of focus on is, um, you know, avoiding those non-target impacts. Um, so what are the safest uses of herbicides uh, or alternative methods um, to protect, um, you know, beneficial species? So um, I'm sure many of you are familiar with what integrated pest management is. Um, but as a brief overview, um, IPM is not just, you know, using multiple methods to control invasive species, um, but it's also all the other things besides the actual action to control. It's things like properly identifying species, um, prioritizing your treatments, um, developing goals for treatments, block. Developing goals, um, the actual implementation itself, of course, um, which includes things like avoiding, um, you know, the invasions um, in the first place. So cultural methods to avoid um, to prevent invasive species from uh, inhabiting your site, and then follow up monitoring to see what the efficacy of your treatments are, or your practices, um, and it's it's a it's a cycle as you can as you I'm sure are familiar. Some of the um, aspects of this cycle that I'll be talking about today are uh, the proper identification of invasive species um, and some tools that you can use to help identify species, um, prioritization, um, some tools that are available to help you prioritize um, treatments, and then um, a lot of what I'll be discussing are um, topics related to implementation, such as what are the relative toxicities of some of the herbicides available um, for treatment? Um, what are some best management practices to avoid impacts on pollinators? Um, how can you, what are some tools we can use to look up potential impacts on listed species and what kind of practices you're required to follow um, when using um, herbicides, um, as well as um, uh, organic herbicides as an alternative, and what are the pros and cons of those? So I'm going to start with some tools that um, you can use to help identify species in the field. Uh, I have a feeling most of you are familiar with iNaturalist. It's a, a mobile app that you can have on your smartphone or your iPad when you're in the field, and all you do is take a picture of your species of interest and upload it to the app and it can give you some uh, possibilities of what that species might be. Um, it uses information from what other folks in the field have documented on the site. So you can use this app to also um, you know, upload data. You can actually um, uh, add data to the site. Um, and a lot of citizen scientists and you know, career scientists do this. And um, as a result, there's a, a large database of information about what species occur across different areas. And so it uses both that spatial information that's in um, the database, as well as the pictorial information, the visual information um, to identify what you know possible species that you might be looking at. So this is a really helpful tool. I use it all the time. I'm not a botanist. And so um, I really rely on tools like this to help me identify species um, that I'm just not familiar with yet. Another great application um, that comes in both a sort of field mobile version and also a desktop version that which interface together is CalFlora and its associated Observer Pro app. Um, so CalFlora is um, like a really um, broad compendium of information. This is um, plant specific, whereas um, uh, the previous app is um, it actually goes across multiple taxa. You can use it for butterflies or, um, you know, bees and other things. Um, CalFlora is plant specific um, and it, a lot of scientists use it and a lot of agencies use it to track their, um, both weeds and natives, natives listed species. Um, 
I actually wanted to take a minute. So this is I, I wanted to mention it's both a useful tool for, for the identification of species, but I also use this app to help um, prioritize and evaluate um, species occurrences um, and sort of plan my treatments. Um, so I wanted to take a minute to just show you what the desktop version of this um, program looks like and um, and walk through some of the useful functions oh, uh, of the program. So I'm going to pop over to a different window. Can you all see the CalFlora website up now? I still see your slide. You still see my slide? Hmm. OK, let's try this again then. So what I'm actually going to do is I'm going to share. My screen instead of my window. OK, now can you see the Cal Flora website? Yes, now lovely. OK, <laughs> so um, for anyone who's not familiar with what Cal Flora is, this is what the website looks like. If you just type in Cal Flora into your Google search bar, this is what will come up. So this is the home page um, right now. Can you can see my cursor? Is that right? So on the upper yes. right hand side, you can see that I'm actually signed in so you can create an account with Cal Flora and this um, uh, you can use the website with or without an account, but there are some additional functions that are available to those that have an account um, and you can save searches. You can you can add observations and track, you know, your own, you know, can conduct monitoring basically using um, this website. So um, it's very helpful to create an account and it's free. So um, I'm just going to walk you through the basics of what's on the website, and then I'll show you a few functions that I find really useful. So on the left hand side here, you can see there are links to um, a few different functions. So the first is my Cal Flora, and that is just I'm going to click on it that are these are just a bunch of resources that are you know useful for um, like training and recent updates that um, that Cal Flora has posted. Um, so there's some training videos actually on some of the things that I'm going to be going over today. So if you want a review of what some of those functions are, this is where you can go. Things like observation search and what grows here are both really useful functions that I'm going to be going over. And there's video tutorials um, that you can check out as well. Um, and other useful resources. And go back to the home page by clicking my Calflora. Um, here you can go to your own ob observations. You can add observations. And then here's a link to some information about the phone apps, um, which is the Observer Pro app, which is available for both um, Android and iOS phones. Um, this homepage um, also is really useful. It, you can search plants um, right here from the homepage. So if you're interested in a particular invasive species or a rare native species, um, you just go ahead and type in the name. It can be the common name or the species name. Um, so for example, uh, let's just look up Spartina foliosa. I thought this would be an interesting example. Um, and if you hit search, basically what it's going to show you are what species of Spartina foliosa occur in um, California. You can see there's two that are shown here. One is the hybrid um, between the invasive Alterniflora and Foliosa, and so that's considered an invasive non-native species, whereas the Foliosa is a native species of cordgrass. And so what you can do is click. If you click on the name, it'll bring you to a map that shows the distribution of that species across California. You might have seen maps like this in presentations before because they're really useful and easy to create, and a lot of people just um, take this map from Cal Flora and, you know, copy and paste it into their presentation to show the the range of a given species. Um, you can also look up a lot of other information about the species. So it gives the general information here. It's a monocot, it's a perennial grass like herb, grass like herb that's not native, and it's um, calypsy rated high. So the California Invasive Plant Council, which Shoba mentioned earlier, is having their symposium. Um, the end of this, well, the early fall, um, 
they rate invasive species um, based on their um, level of impact to the environment. And high is the highest rating they have. They have also moderate and low. Um, and so um, these ratings are really useful to follow as sort of um, habitat managers because they're a little bit more relevant to our work than the CDFA ratings that are more relevant to impacts on agri agriculture. Um, so you can look at plant, plant range, you can look at, uh, it also provides a bunch of uh, specific characteristics of the plant. Um, so there's you know, bloom period and whatnot. So this is a useful resource for looking up um, information specific to plants. Now, if you look up the range of Spartina foliosa, um, it's interesting to see that the range is quite a bit more broad um, than that invasive. So um, that. You can also look up, um, you know, a variety of species if you're not sure what um, which species um, you know you're interested in. You could look up groups of species based on their life form, uh, the county that they're found, um, the kind of life history they have, or um, phenology, the um, whether they're native or invasive. And I often use the Calypsi invasive plants. Um, tag to find invasive species, and then the community, et cetera. Um, so now I'm going to go into this observation search um, link, which is um, another really useful resource for looking up information about invasive species on a site or species as a whole, really. Um, so this search brings you to a separate window that looks similar to the other. You can do searches by species or county and other, other factors. Um, but this is a search that will pull up information about all of the documented um, occurrences, um, all of the data that's in their database um, about a given species or a range of species. Um, so for example, you could look up something as broad as all species in San Francisco County. So the County of San Francisco, all species, all we'll say Cal Ipsy listed species um, that have been recorded in San Francisco County since 2020, we'll say. So 1 1 2020, San Francisco, and hit search. And so you can see what pulls up is each of these dots on the map here represent a recorded observation. So the one I'm pointing out right now is Janista. Oh gosh, I don't know what species this is. Monspasulana. Uh, not familiar with that species, but um, the the common name. You could, I believe, you can click it, and I'll have more information here. So. Um, Oh, but not the not the common name. Record detail. Here we go. French broom. OK, I should know that one. You guys probably know that one. <laughs> um, so anyway, this is a list of all of the um, the documented um, recordings of invasive species on the site. And we can see that. So there's 195 records. That's quite a few. Um, so if you're interested, you can take um, you can actually download this data. Go to tools, download results, and there you'll have, a, you know, essentially documented all of the recorded information. Um, or if you're interested, um, another way to do this is rather than searching by an entire county, you can actually draw a polygon on a map. So if you're only interested in um, a certain part of San Francisco, let's say, there's not too much in Golden Gate Park, but let's say you're only in for interested in the Presidio. Um, then you can draw a polygon. Oh, oh, oh. Getting a little confused. OK, we're going to just go out and come back in.
Boop. <laughs> All right, so draw a polygon. Start drawing. Doesn't have to be perfect. Oh, come on. Go. Just do that. It's not the perfect, but uh, for the purpose of. OK, and then um, you can do a search within the polygon. Any Calypsy listed species. And we'll just say that have ever been recorded. So I didn't indicate a date and you can see there are 991 records of invasive species that have ever been recorded within that polygon. I missed parts of the Presidio, but. Um, anyhow, so this is a really useful way to look up data um, around a specific area. Um, another quick thing that I'll show you is you can look up by other things um, in this. There's a layers option here that provides you know, um, a lot of different layers you can add to your map, and you can look up by protected areas, which can be especially useful for those of us that work on protected areas. So, um, so if you click protected areas um, now, your shape. I don't know how to get rid of that window. That's the only annoying thing. We'll just go back again. OK. So we'll go back and do by region. We'll do a protected area. And you can see that um, protected areas have popped up on the map, different colors, and you can actually search by a protected area if you wanted to. So the way you do that is you just click on it. Um, this is the San Francisco watershed lands where there's restricted access and then you just select in selected area and you can do a search based on that. So um, a lot of really useful ways to look up data in a given area. One other function I just want to quickly go over is um, is the tool. Um, oops. Is the what grows here tool. And this is helpful because um, you can look up in a given area. Um, you could either draw a polygon or save. If you if you saved a polygon in the past, you can do that. Um, but let's say I'm interested in knowing just anything that grows in an area that let's say I'm working in. So we'll go back um, to the Presidio. And we'll just say I'm interested in knowing because I'm going to do some field monitoring out here. Should be drawing a polygon. Stop drawing. Start drawing again. There we go. OK, so I'm interested to know. Um, let's see. Again, you can look by status. Um, we'll just do all species for now. Um, OK, so anything that grows in this area is going to come up in, on my list. And it shows there's 244 annual herbs, 295 perennial herbs, etc. cetera. Um, now I can create an illustrated plant list based on that. That's kind of a lot of species, so I might want to just do them separately or um, maybe we'll just do an example with Calypsy listed species in this area. So I'm going to do another search for just Calypsy listed. Now it's 124 plants. That's a little bit more of a manageable size. And what I'll do is I'll create an illustrated plant list. And it pops up like this. Now you have an illustrated plant list showing uh, pictures of the invasive species. Um, it's it's um, common name and species name and bloom period. And you can print this out and hand it out to folks that are gonna be doing surveys for you, folks that are gonna be out there doing some treatments, let's say. So these are the plants that they could be looking out for that they, they should be treating, let's say. Um, you could also do this with listed species to you know make sure you're not treating the listed species in the, that area. Um, and and I, I should mention that you know this is dependent on 
whether people have entered data for this given um, region or area that you're interested in. So if there's no data on them, then um, you know it may not be um, all inclusive, I guess is what I need to say. Okay, so um, that is that is the bit of CalFlor I wanted to share with you. Um, I hope some of those tools might be useful to you. Um, and I hope that's not too, that wasn't, um, you know, redundant with stuff you're already doing and already know all about. But um, the also I want to mention that there's the Cal Flora Weed Manager app that also is really, I understand is really useful for weed managers to track management and, you know, which, which management um, tools you're using in a given area and tracking um, the effectiveness over time. Um, and it's something that CFW is considering um, using for our, our sites. We haven't gone that route yet, but um, some of our sites have used it and they find it to be really helpful. So there's also another tool um, that's available that also um, uh, utilizes data from CalFlora um, and Cal or Calypsy. Um, it's called Whippet. And um, this is a tool that prioritizes uh, weed treatments based on the impacts of um, the species um, that you're interested in, its invasiveness, and the feasibility of control based on conditions. So it uses um, spatial data and it integrates that with an analysis of these factors. Um, you basically you basically select your species of interest and the area you want to analyze. Um, and as I mentioned, it taps into Calypsis inventory, CalFlora, and other sources of data. Um, it's basically the scoring criteria. Um, this is, I know the text is a bit small, so if you can't read it, that's okay. Um, but essentially, it it's a um, it it it's able to analyze a variety of factors. So things like um, the impact of the invasive species has to do with both the impact to wildlands. Um, based on the species, but also the value of the site. You know, how valuable is the site? Is this a protected area? Are there listed species that are occurring on the site? Um, and if so, maybe that's a more um, a higher prioritized um, area to treat. Um, its invasiveness might have to do not only with just the factors within a species, but also distance to other um, populations of the same species. What are the rate? What's the rate of spread of that given species? And then what's the distance to dispersal vectors, things like rivers and roads, um, and that will impact um, how you prioritize um, that species. Also, the feasibility of eradication has to do with how big the population or that infestation is, um, its reproductive ability, um, its detectability, so that, you know, is it easily detectable? And so are you more likely to be able to eradicate it? Um, access, site access, and then the effectiveness of control, um, given what methods are available to you, as well as cost. So these are all fac factors, and, and you can actually even adjust how the factors are weighted in the analysis. Um, so it's a really cool tool, um, and Gina Darren developed it um, out of UC Davis. Um, she's now with DWR, um, but if you had any questions, I'm sure she'd be happy to work with you on how to use that resource. OK, so summary of some of the tools that are helpful in both identifying and prioritizing um, weed treatments are iNaturalist, that sort of really handy popular app that is used to identify species um, in the field, CalFlora. It's a great database that you can use and also enter data into for plant uh, recording or looking up plant occurrences, as well as Whippet, which is a weed prioritization tool. All right, so now getting into um, the relative toxicity of um, various herbicides um, to um, different different taxa. And um, I actually wasn't able to summarize information about amphibians. I'm working at that moment. I'm working on that at the moment. Um, but I'm going to be presenting today um, information on pollinators and aquatic species. So first, um, let's take a look at the pollinator species. Um, I'm listing here a variety of herbicide active ingredients and their associated trade names, or some of the common ones anyway. 
Um, and this is not an all inclusive list of everything you might use, but I'm hoping it covers a number of the um, products you you use. Um, some of the products that um, you all told me you used, um, unfortunately, were not in the database that I um, looked to for this information. So there's a database called the B Precaution database, which is um, developed, I believe, by the Xerces Society. Um, and it is very helpful. It, it essentially has collected toxicology data for them. Um, um, you know, pollinator toxicity studies and um, looked at potential impacts from different active ingredients. And then it ranks those active ingredients based on their safety to pollinators. Um, and this is all, this is bees actually, so um, specific to bees. Um, and, you know, uh, notably, most of the studies occur in honeybee populations, um, not wild bee populations. So, um, the impacts may diff differ, you know, between uh, those sort of the way that they um, act and, and whatnot. But anyhow, so what you can see from this list is that um, a number of the herbicides that are commonly used um, are, are relatively safe or at least have not have not shown to have um, significant impacts on bees. So they're rated three and um, they're considered to only have indirect effects, which means essentially, um, you know, by killing plants that, you know, potentially could be flowering plants, you uh, may impact bees because of, you know, the, the impact on habitat. Um, but there have not been any direct um, toxicity, um, direct toxicity has not been found um, in bees. And that's for all those um, listed in green. There are a few herbicide act active ingredients that are, you um, that have been shown to have some effects on bees, including um, toxic to the honeybee brood or um, other bee species. And many of these are sublethal effects. So there may be effects on, you know, growth, um, oops, feeding, um, et cetera. So those are 2,4-D, which are, um, which is a broadleaf um, specific herbicide. Uh, one common product is called weedar. Others are just go by the name 2,4-D. Um, I included copper hydroxide in here because it's not a herbicide per se, but it is used a lot for algae control in aquatic environments. Um, and it's actually considered an organic um, or pesticide. Um, it's a fungicide and an algicide and even maybe a bactericide. Um, but um, it, it's actually pretty, it, it can be toxic to, to bees. Um, so that's an interesting Side note, um, and then glyphosate. Um, you all are probably familiar with the fact that glyphosate has um, been shown to have some sublethal effects, direct sublethal effects on bees. Um, and so it's listed in the yellow as well. And then at the bottom, I'm including an insecticide that's commonly used and also widely known to have significant impacts on bees, and that's imidacloprid. Um, and and that's a, you know an example of red, um, where there are definite direct effects on bees and also it's toxic to the brood and you know several bee species um, and this is the case actually with most insecticides you know insecticides because they specifically target insects um, are gonna likely have inadvertent effects on other insect species so um, I also did a search for impacts of um, various um, aquatic labeled um, product, uh, herbicide products on aquatic species. Um, and I, I compiled this information from EPA's Ecotox database. Um, EPA compiles toxicity data from basically all studies and puts it all into one database where you can look up um, any kind of potential contaminant. It could even be um, natural toxins like microcystin is in there, um, but also tons of pesticides and um, and other, you know, pollutants such as um, PCBs, um, uh, some, some plastics, things like that. Um, so I analyzed for um, a number of different herbicides and um, compiled information and looked at essentially the studies that found the worst effects. So the, the most severe responses. And I listed them in terms of the 
the concentration that caused a significant effect, and that's in fish and invertebrates. And in this case, with a mazamox, um, there were no um, lethal. And so I was looking at lethal effects um, above 100 milligrams per liter. And um, this by EPA's, EPA categorizes um, uh, chemicals based on their toxicity um, based on these categories that I provided. So greater than 100 ppm is basically non-toxic um, down to, you know, highly toxic, which is less than 0.1. Um, and so I kind of followed EPA's guidelines to create these categories. But this is data that I compiled. It's not data that EPA has um, has provided. So um, take it with a grain of salt. Um, but um, as you can see, there are a few chemicals on the list that um, really have almost no toxicity. I mean, uh, greater than 100 ppm is is quite is a lot of material. It, you'd have to dump, you know, an entire um, you know, tank of or an entire um, container of a Mazamox in a water body to get to get 100 ppm. That's that's a lot of material. Um, and at that level, there was no effects on um, on on fish and invertebrates or sorry, no lethal effects. And um, in addition to that, I'm including the National Pollutant Discharge Elimination System maximum limitations. And this is essentially how much EPA considers to be a safe amount in the environment. And for Mazamox, there's no limit. So you are not exceeding um, their limit, even if you detect 100 parts per million um, after you do a treatment, um, when you do monitoring for NPDES. Um, whereas with Garlin and Vaslin, um, the sort of safe level is considered to be 13 parts per million. Which is again for a um, a chemical in water that's a pretty high amount, um, and so um, that's an indication that this is a real a pretty safe product as well. Um, where the Mazapir products, Habitat and Polaris, um, that level is 11.2 ppm, um, and then it goes down to some of the products that are um, kind of moderately safe: uh, Fluoridone, Fumioxazin, Carfentrazone, and then Glyphosate. And all of those, um, you know, are kind of in the yellow in terms of their potential effects on aquatic invertebrates and fish. Um, and as you can see, the NPDES ratings follow um, similarly. And flum flumioxazin and carfentrazone don't have maximum limitations like a Mazmox. And partly that could be because um, these are newer products and they just haven't been developed yet. Um, and glyphosate, as you can see, is uh, 0.7 parts per million, which is a, a little higher even than fluoridone. Um, so it's, it's um, you know, based on the data, it's actually one of the just moderately toxic or, uh, you know, compounds relative to some of the other ones that are also registered for aquatic uses. So it's definitely not the worst um, in, in terms of aquatic impacts. Um, and it's also probably the most studied compound. Uh, it is the most studied herbicide. So the data that I use to look at glyphosate, there are like probably, um, you know, hundreds of studies, whereas some of these others only had 10 studies. Um, and so that, you know, and I'm looking at the the worst outcomes, the you know, study that showed the greatest effect. And so um, there's some, you know, um, uh, that will affect, you know, the results. Oops. Um, so you can see some of these other compounds that are a little more toxic. Again, a common one is 2,4-D and copper. Um, I'm including that again because it's commonly used in aquatic environments, and um, it's it's highly toxic to fish and invertebrates. 2,4-D um, also um, primarily 2,4-D is known to be toxic to invertebrates, um, but it also has impacts on fish. Same with diquat. This is a common one that's used in the Bay Delta system, um, but it is it is highly toxic to invertebrates. So um, there's you know reason to be for caution in that in that regard. Now here at the bottom is a ingredient you may or may not have heard of, nonylphenol. Um, I'd be just curious, can anyone tell me what um, nonylphenol is an ingredient in which product? Does anybody have an idea? Maybe you saw. Um, I quickly went to the next slide that actually had a. Laundry, you're welcome to, laundry oh, detergent. Go. It used to be in laundry detergent. It was in lots of other uh, cleaning products, but they've been 
the EPA has some. Yeah, OK. Yeah, it's it's it is in uh, lots of different products. Um, I didn't know it was in laundry detergent, so I, that's I learned something <laughs> um, there. I'm thinking specifically about as it relates to weed control. Does anyone know what this product, this chemical might be in in regards to weed control? Or this chemical, it's not a product. All right, I'll give you a hint. Um, here are a couple um, of the names of products. Are you all familiar with R11 or Activator 90? Um, so these are two of the most common adjuvants that are added to um, two products to help them bind to um, you know, leaf surfaces, um, also referred to as surfactants. And um, the nonalphenol surfactants are also, they're often the active ingredients actually um, typically listed as alkyl phenol ethoxylates. And nonalphenol is uh, what it breaks down to rapidly when it enters waterways. Um, and this, as you can see from the list, is one of the most highly toxic ingredients in a herbicide mixture. Um, and even you can see from the NPDES maximum limitation, that it is, you know, magnitudes lower than glyphosate, the glyphosate limitation. Um, and everybody focuses on how, you know, harmful glyphosate can be to non-target species. But look at how much more harmful just the adjuvant that you add to your tank mix is, um, could potentially be to, to non-target species. Um, and this is true with honeybees too. Um, I wasn't able to find, unfortunately, on the bee precaution database, they don't have nonalphenol listed. Um, or the alkyl phenols. Um, uh, but, you know, again, this is something that's often really broadly overlooked in how um, people plan treatments. Um, I have discussions all the time with managers about, you know, they're doing all the safest methods using the best management practices, using aquatic safe, you know, formulations and, you know, avoiding um, using glyphosate or whatever it might be. But they're using one of these nonophenol adjuvants, and um, you know that 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 could potentially have the greatest effect. Um, so, how do you know whether your adjuvant that you use is a nonophenol adjuvant? You look at the active ingredients on there. If it says alkyl phenol ethoxylate on there, or something that sounds similar to that, a lot of times it's some some other kind of phenol ethoxylate, um, an alcohol ethoxylate of some sort. Um, that's the one. That, those are the ones you want to avoid. What are some adjuvant alternatives that are actually fine in the environment? Um, these are two really common ones, Agridex, Competitor, another good one is Hasten. Um, and these are like modified vegetable oils, basically. Um, and well, they, it says that Competitor is a modified, but they're essentially vegetable oils. Um, and I actually, as a part of my research at UC Davis, studied Agridex specifically, and we put, you know, hundreds of milligrams of this stuff per liter into um you know petri dishes or beakers with um, delta smelt embryo in there and they were fine it was it literally became milky with how how heavy um, the concentration was of this stuff and they were fine so um i have, pers I have personal um experience with how safe these products specifically are um to fish anyway um, but I've also seen um, research showing that they're really safe with aquatic invertebrates as well. And uh, terrestrial invertebrates. Um, it's just the oily kind of aspect of them that can be a problem. OK, so quickly I'm going to go through um, one more resource um, for uh, looking at. So in addition to selecting, of course, your safest herbicides and adjuvants, uh, for treatments, um, one thing to think about is um, are there endangered species that occur in your specific site? And are there certain measures that you need to take to protect those species? Um, so again, I'm going to quickly pop over and I'm going to do this quickly because I realize I'm kind of going too slow. Uh, uh, there it is. Okay. So I'm just going to show you all what this prescribed online database looks like. Um, this is a database that's 
um, put together by the California Department of Pesticide Regulation. And it utilizes um, information from US EPA, US Fish and Wildlife on um, where um, uh, listed species occur and what kind of um, habitat protection measures must be followed. And the habitat protection measures are from US Fish and Wildlife Services biological opinions and local plans developed through the cooperation of the County Ag Commissioner and Sealers Association, the California Department of Fish and Wildlife, and um, California Department of Food and Agriculture. So that's where these sort of habitat protection measures are coming from that I'm going that I'm about to show you, just so you know. Okay, so basically all you gotta do is start a query. And the query is going to be based on um, township range and section information. So this is information you're gonna have to come to this database with. Um, you can also search by county and you can just search all the township range sections within a county. Um, and that's what we're going to do today for the purpose of this demonstration. So I'm just going to go ahead and show you what if we wanted to look at all of the conservation measures you need to follow in San Francisco County. So add San Francisco, add selective, and then go to the next section. And then these, this is now going to list all the townships within San Francisco County. I'm going to add all of them so we can just look at the whole county. And then now it's going to show all the sections, uh, the ranges. All right. Anyway. Oh, yeah. Okay. Those are the selected items. Now it's going to show all the sections. I'm going to add all. So there's 71 sections within. San Francisco County. If you don't know what that is, just look it up. It's basically um, like parcels of land. Um, next. And so now this is a list of all of the listed species that um, occur within San Francisco County. And if you click on them, it'll just give you some details about the species. You can use that as a resource, um, but uh oh, my battery's been low. Um, more interestingly, I'm gonna go to next as I plug in my computer. Um, you can look up specific products that you might be using in an area. So you add the rodeo. And didn't mean to that. That's okay. We moved selected. Okay, so we'll, we're going to look up rodeo, and that is a glyphosate-based herbicide. Um, and then if you scroll down, it's going to provide um, observed use limits. These are the use limits for the selected products. I'm going to let you read that as I. Krista. Oh, yeah. Okay. Can you read it? Is it too small? Okay. So essentially, um, for glyphosate in San Francisco County, the use limits include an occupied habit. It says, do not use in currently occupied habitat except if specific, uh, except if specified in species descriptions or in organized habitat recovery programs or for selective control of invasive exotic plants. And then um, the next use limitation, it has to do with spray drift. And it essentially says, um, be careful about sp spray drift and do not make applications within 200 yards by air or 40 yards by ground upwind from occupied habitat. Um, that's habitat occupied by any of these listed species. Um, and you can work with your county ag commissioner um, on circumstances where it might be allowed. Um, so this is a useful website and resource to use if you want to get a sense of, you know, which potential listed species occur in your treatment site and what special conditions you need to follow. Um, I will say glyphosate is one of the few that actually has special conditions listed for it. 
And to be safe, I generally like to follow the same conditions for other herbicides that I used because there may not be special conditions required, but um, I think it's a kind of a, a safe, these are safe guidelines to follow to protect, you know, listed species. Um, there are also, of course, guidelines with um, specific listed species like um, the stipulated injunction with red-legged frog that um, is separate from this that should be followed. Okay, so I'm going to go back to my presentation. Okay, so in summary, avoid alkyl phenyl ethoxylate um, or other or similar adjuvants. Use the safest active ingredient you can, um, given your circumstances, and look up special conditions you need to follow in the prescribed database. All right, now I'm gonna go over, I realize I have just a few more minutes, so I'm gonna try to go through these a little bit quickly, but I, or maybe I have a little more. Is it okay if I take 20 more minutes? 15 to... That's absolutely fine, Krista. Okay. Yeah. Okay, great. <laughs> um, so now I'm going to go through um, some best management practices um, to protect pesticide to protect pollinators, um, bees and other pollinators. And um, these are a series of slides that actually come directly from the Xerces Society. I um, received permission to present these slides, and um, so I'm mostly just going to be kind of reading from them. I apologize for that since these are not my slides, but they're, I thought they were a really useful source of information. Um, we had some folks from Xerces come and present to our group um, last year, and, um, and you know, they're a great resource for anything pollinator related, so highly recommend reaching out to them. Um, but in general, so um, in re related to pesticides and pollinators, um, toxicity research is still fairly limited uh, for many native pollinators, especially. So a lot of the work is done in honeybees, as I mentioned before, which are kind of the model um, species for pollinators in general. Um, and there's especially little research um, looking at fungicides and herbicides. A lot of those that research is done on insecticides because those are the ones that are most impactful. Um, and of course, there's always the unknown of mixtures, how you know different chemicals mixed together on a site might affect an organism more than um, the individual components that are, you know, which is how we usually study them. Um, pesticide use, especially insecticides, can contribute to pollinator declines. And that's especially been shown with um, uh, some of uh, you know, the metacloprid type compounds, um, other insecticides. Um, but also sublethal impacts can reduce populations. So that's why we're still interested in protecting bees from um, herbicides and other pollinators. So some of the pathways bees can become exposed to herbicides, there's several. It's not just, you know, spraying a bee or, or spraying, you know, the flower that the bee would then pollinate, but there's other things. They can, um, bees use nest material, so they can use foliage from plants as nest material. That's another way that they can become contaminated. Um, probably the most common is um, exposure from, you know, pollinating flowers or collecting nectar um, and pollen from flowers. Um, when they land on the flower that's recently been sprayed, they're going to get um, pesticide on them. Um, other ways, though, is you can contaminate their nesting sites. Many of our native bees are ground nesters, and um, spraying herbicides on the ground can contaminate their sites directly, um, or systemic contact. So if you spray a systemic herbicide that then, you know, gets incorporated into the material of a plant, and um, the bees, you know, use that for foraging, um, they could get um, contaminated that way as well. So these are all sort of potential exposure pathways. Um, but as I mentioned, probably the most common would be that indirect contact um, on the flower. And one of the most common herbicide impacts is really the indirect effects. And so that is essentially the removal of their habitat, um, both the flowers for foraging and also host plants such as uh, milkweed um, for the monarch butterflies or other beneficial host plants that butterflies require for their life cycle. Um, also reductions in plant vigor can reduce forage quality, um, et cetera. Um, herbicide impacts 
Um, as I kind of mentioned, they rarely kill pollinators outright, but they can have um, sublethal effects that are significant. Um, most of the toxicity studies are done at really high concentrations in order to have a significant result that can be you know, useful. Um, but sometimes there are even studies with lower doses that are that are impact that you know have been shown to be significant. Um, there's a, a bunch of studies that are still in in EPA review. And so hopefully we'll have more information out in the near future. Um, some of the results that have come out of glyphosate research, uh, research with glyphosate and bees, is that glyphosate can change honeybee gut micro, the gut microbiome, um, high doses delay molting, reduce brood survival and weight. Um, they have impaired navigational and learning abilities, and there can be effects on the immune system. And again, these are at generally higher concentrations, most of these studies than what you'd expect to see in the field, but still, um, you know, there are definitely possibility, there's definitely a possibility of um, uh, significant effects on bees. Um, some other studies have shown that amazapir, cethoxidim, and triclopyr reduce larval survivorship in butterflies. Um, though the authors of that study suspected the impacts might be due to the inert ingredients in the formulations and not due to the active ingredients themselves. So that's something that should be studied further is looking at, you know, isolated active ingredients versus, um, you know, formulations because that there is often a real difference. A lot of times those inert ingredients are the, are the bad ones actually. Dicamba though has been shown to reduce caterpillar and pupil mass, and 2,4-D, again, is one that has potential larval toxicity. And I, again, just because that one is another one that was mentioned with some of the um, terrestrial insect, well, bees and, um, and aquatic um, fish and invertebrates. So what are some methods that um, we can all use? Um, um, best management practices to reduce the impacts of um, our weed management program on pollinators. Um, one is to consider non-chemical options, of course, um, something that's definitely, you know, we need to consider, you know, grazing as much as we can. Use goats, you know, use mowing. Um, mowing at the right time can sometimes be really effective, if, especially if you're um, talking about annual infestations as opposed to perennials. Um, make sure that you're training your staff in plant identification, and we talked about some tools you can use for that uh, to make sure that you're not having impacts on beneficial species, you know, um, like these milkweeds that we see in the picture. Um, and when you're doing your weed treatments, you're in, not inadvertently affecting uh, beneficial plants. Um, choose selective herbicides when you can, so rather than these broad spectrum herbicides that kill everything, Um, or um, you can selectively treat, um, you know, in time, you know, based on the phenology of the plants and, the, you know, beneficial plants versus your weeds. Um, use targeted application, so spot spraying, basal bark treatments, et cetera, um, and consider removing blooms before spraying. That's another way you can um, remove that sort of potential source of contamination to pollinators. Um, of course, or just don't spray during blooming periods is, a, is another big one. So time management, avoid pollinator exposure by managing when pollinators are not present or active. So um, either, and I just mentioned this, when, um, when either the plants are not in bloom or when um, pollinators are not active. So not in the middle of the day, just doing, during cooler hours, you know, early in the morning or late late after after the sun has gone down. Um, target the most vulnerable stage of the plants. Um, and that's useful because you need less product, you know, so less potential for contamination um, to non-target species. So as I mentioned, where the source of data that I used for my analysis of uh, comparing tox toxicities of products was the bee precaution pesticide rating database. Um, it's a really easy tool to use. You can look up any product you're interested in, and this is what it looks like. It shows you the rating. Uh, it, it has um, specific, it specifies its mode of action, 
etc. And here are some other Xerces resources that you can um, check out for more information about protecting habitat and um, protecting pollinators. So in summary, consider alternatives to chemical approaches when feasible. Um, use the Bee Precaution Database um, for a resource to understand what, you know, whether the compound you're using is toxic to bees and uh, avoid pollinators by following uh, best management practices. All right, so I'm just going to quickly run through some of the pros and cons um, of organic herbicides. Um, many folks, and I would say perhaps the public, is interested in switching over to organic herbicides rather than their synthetic counterparts. Um, organic um, sounds better, it's a natural product, um, and a lot of folks um, uh, believe that these are much safer in the environment. Um, and, and at times it's very true. Um, but there are some issues with organic. Um, and before I get into these, I'm going to go back. Um, I just want to mention that um, I, I unfortunately missed that in my overview of the toxicology of various um, compounds to bees, there were two organic herbicides in there, and they both were in the green. They were considered to be safe for bees. Um, and, and that was good for me to see. I was concerned that actually they might have impacts. Um, many organic herbicides act by essentially their acidic properties. Um, so they're basically acids like, you know, using vinegar, um, like a lot of we, you know, a lot of us do around our households. If um, we don't want to use um, chemicals, we use vinegar to kill plants. Um, and a lot of them act similarly. They're contact herbicides and um, they're usually acidic. Um, and as a result, they actually can be, um, you know, they can, that acidity can be harmful itself. And so um, it's definitely something to think about. Um, but what's nice about organics is they, they, you know, they do break down into natural um, sort of breakdown products and they break down relatively quickly. Um, so in that sense, they, they probably, you know, they're, they're safer in that regard, rather relative to some, some of the synthetics. Um, although um, synthetics is maybe a, um, a misleading because they're also organic compounds in the sense that they're made from, you know, um, carbon, oxygen, <laughs> um, things like that. So um, they often break down into organic materials as well. Um, so some of the negatives, some of the cons of organics um, that I think a lot of folks kind of miss or don't don't realize is that um, they're often misinterpreted. Um, they sometimes can be harmful and um, and some products like copper are considered organic because they are natural um, materials. I mean, they, they occur naturally, but they're also really toxic, you know, so you can think about, you know, mercury is technically organic. Um, it's not certified as an organic herbicide, but copper is um, and copper is um, it certifies a organic fungicide, I should say, um, an algicide, um, but it it can be harmful. Um, other things like um, there are insecticides that are derived from organic ingredients. So, per um, per pyrethrin is a pyre is the organic version of pyrethroids, and pyrethroids are insecticides that are commonly used in agriculture, highly toxic to fish, highly toxic to invertebrates. And the base chemical of that is pyrethrin, which comes from the chrysanthemum flower. And that is considered an organic herbicide. The organic version is less persistent and therefore less harmful in the long term in the environment, but it still is toxic. So things to consider. Um, organic herbicides also only work by contact action. So they're not systemic. So sometimes you need to use a lot more product Pretty much always you need to use a lot more product to kill a plant um, and as a result you're not only you know some of these can be harmful themselves but you're using so much more material um, so that's something to consider you know even if their magnitudes um, less harmful to a non-target species you may be using magnitudes more so um, organic herbicides are also typically exempt from us epa 
um, registration and evaluation processes. Um, and so as a result, they have less testing. There just is less data out there about, you know, their potential non-target impacts, whereas glyphosate has been tested through and through. There's thousands of studies, it seems at least hundreds on, you know, glyphosate and non-target impacts on humans and the environment. Um, organic herbicides just haven't been studied like that. So there are a lot of unknowns. Um, so it, there's, you know, there's a reason to um, be, you know, uh, practice caution with them. Uh, also, they're substantially more expensive, something to consider. Um, and another thing is they should never be used near water. Um, their acidic properties um, really have significant impacts on water quality, and they can be toxic to fish and um, aquatic invertebrates and amphibians. Um, so they should never, they're not um, registered for use near water. Um, so in summary, um, I hope that you all enjoyed uh, this sort of cycle, this run through of um, a variety of tools and resources that you can use to help identify, um, to evaluate and prioritize, and also to implement your weed control programs um, in the Bay Area or wherever you are. Um, and I am happy to answer questions um, if we have time. <laughs>